Okay, so, quick question. Let's say all you've been told about how the world works is from Greek mythology. And someone has asked you, just now, how the world works. What would you say? If you're anything like these three philosophers from Miletus, an ancient Greek city on the coast of modern-day Turkey, then the myths of Homer's Odyssey didn't really do it for you, but the natural world around you did. It's pretty important to remember that these three only had Greek mythology as an explanation of the world, and that atheism was in fact a punishable offence, which led to the exile of another natural philosopher, Anagoras, but that's an another story. I'll cover it at some point in the future. The point is, it's pretty difficult to question the origin of the world in ancient Greece, let alone try to explain it. But that's what they tried to do. The first philosopher that, that we know of is Thales, and he was born around 1620 BC, or BCE. Thales was also one of the first astronomers and mathematicians in ancient Greece, as he learned about both from somewhere in Egypt, which it's presumed it's Babylon, but no one really knows to be honest, he, he did a lot with his life. Thales was one of the first which we know of who tried to explain the origin of all things, and I would argue that would class him as one of the, the earliest scientists to have lived as well. But of course, this is only going over Western philosophy. Um, maybe some point in the future I'll do Eastern philosophy as well, if that interests you guys. But right now we're sticking with Western philosophy. While Thales was travelling through Egypt, one of the things he noticed was how crops would begin to grow the moment when floods from the River Nile receded back. And he also probably noticed how frogs and insects were rocking around right after in the exact same areas. He also probably considered how water could turn into ice or maybe steam and then turn straight back into water again. Considering these things, Thales believed that the, that the origin of all things was in fact water. Another Malaysian philosopher who was knocking about at around the same time as Thales was Anajamanda whose idea of how the world works was honestly pretty confusing and philosophers still can't really grasp what he means by what he said but we, we have a decent idea at least. Anajamanda theorised that our world was one of many and all of these worlds would dissolve and evolve in what was known as the boundless. Now, what he means by the boundless is, is the unclear bit. There's lots of different theories which have been put forwards. Perhaps he meant that the boundless was a substance of sorts, which was far too complex for us to witness on Earth, however, operated in a similar manner to how Thales believed water did in that it was the origin of all things. Maybe he meant that the boundless was an area of sorts in which new things and substances were created and worlds would take some, some of the things by dissolving into it and hence things were able to change form. Jostein Garda, the author of Sophie's World, suggested that perhaps he meant that the substance for all things had to be something other than the things created. Whatever Anajamanda meant by the boundless, he's definitely managed to confuse philosophers for centuries. Fortunately though, Anajimenes, who was born 50 years after Thales, liked the idea of a known substance a lot more than the unknown substance idea. So he went ahead with that. But Anajimenes did not agree with Thales' idea of water being the source but in fact, believed it was air. Now, how did he come up with the idea that it was air? Well, he must have wondered where water actually came from and decided that it was actually compressed air, which was a reverse of how Thales perceived air becoming water. Anajimenes also noticed that when it rains, water comes from the clouds and the sky and believed that hence it was getting compressed 
He must have also seen how sand and mud could be found out of melting an ice block, and hence came to the conclusion that if you keep condensing air, you can create earth. Anna Germanis also reasoned that if you spread out air even more, you can get fire. As a result, he was able to explain the main elements in the world using air as the base substance, which Thales was unable to do. I think the challenging aspect when looking at the three Malaysian philosophers is that it's very different than if you were looking at, say, Plato or Socrates. When looking at the latter two, the questions which they tackled are very clearly ambiguous and still applicable to the modern day. Questions such as, is there such a thing as a soul, is something which personally I believe we will never be able to answer. And that makes it quite easy to think over how they would have thought of things. And because it is unable to be answered, we can think over the question itself. But with the natural philosophers, they pose themselves a question which has actually now been solved and had a definitive answer. So it is, so we cannot actually place ourselves in the shoes of the natural philosophers because the question has been solved. So really the question for us when we are looking at these natural philosophers is what can we learn? Because that's essentially what philosophy comes down to. I think there's a lot of key themes which exist in philosophy and we see throughout history. But I think there are also some which exist just for these three. Firstly, they and all philosophers teach us to question practically everything around us, which is either unknown or taken as fact. As it's often repeated within the circle, philosophy is derived from the Greek word philosophia, meaning love of wisdom. So how can we as philosophers ever become wise if we never question things? Be it, an, be it an authority, the people around us, or group thought. Specifically for these three, they were the first to go against the gods, and more importantly, question an authority which many viewed as absolute, and risk potentially being smited down by the potentially existing gods, or being stoned to death by the definitely existing humans. We can also learn that new experiences are pivotal to being able to improve our theories, even if they don't revolve around the thing which we are investigating. Personally, my greatest periods of growth, my greatest periods of growth in one thing has often come from when I was being challenged in something completely unrelated. And I was able to relate that experience to the growth of the original thing. In the same way, Thales and Anna Germanis must have experienced something to give them the idea that air and water were the origin of all things, such as when the river Nile flooded. As philosophers, it can be very easy to formulate our ideas based on the books, videos, media, and the thoughts which we have at 2am. <laughs> but... I think we lose a fundamental aspect of philosophy if we only stick to that because the experiences which happen in reality are in fact what makes our theories stronger and more reliable and accurate. When looking at the actual theories of the three Malaysian philosophers, the key takeaway is that they all relate back to the idea of there being one single base substance, be it something in reality or something on a separate plane or world or whatever Anna Germanis meant. <laughs> this is important to remember because this formed the foundation for future debate of philosophers for many years afterwards. Check out this video if you want to learn about the debate between Parmenides and Heraclitus, which revolved around that key principle. And if you enjoyed, consider subscribing. You'll get new videos pushed out to your sub box, and it will tell me that you're enjoying these videos, so I'll make more. Other than that, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.